Hey there everyone, I am Janine Marab and I'm introducing myself on behalf of our group. Today, we're diving to the awesome world of drama. You are with the group to know whether you're a big fan or just curious. You're in for a treat. So kick back, relax, and let's uncover the coolness of drama together. As I've said in the intro, this day we're going to talk all about drama. So the first question is, what is drama? Drama refers to a literary genre or theatrical performance that explores human conflicts and emotions, often featuring characters in intense situations. In broader usage, it can also describe real-life situations or works in television and film that evoke strong emotions and interpersonal tension. So, the primary aim of drama is to engage the audience emotionally and intellectually by exploring the complexities of human relationships and the emotional struggles character face. In literature, Drama is typically written as plays, scripts, or dialogues, and it may be performed on stage or adapted for film and television. The genre often delves into the depth of human experience, portraying characters facing moral dilemmas, internal conflicts, and challenging situations that evoke strong emotions. Most of us naman have an idea on what drama is. Like if the topic is pertaining to a drama, iniisip na natin na more on emotion yung movie. However, the term drama is not limited to the realm of literature and theater. It has a broader application in the everyday language and can be used to describe real-life situations or works in television and film that evoke strong emotions and interpersonal tension. In everyday language, drama is often used to describe real-life situations that involve intense emotions, conflicts, or tension between individuals. One of the examples for this is kapag there's heated argument or emotional confrontation sa pagitan ng friends or family members. People can call it a drama. Last, to sum up all of the things that I've mentioned, drama, whether in literature, theater, or other forms of media, serves as a powerful means of exploring the complexities of the human condition and capturing the essence of emotional and interpersonal struggles. Classification of Dramatic Play Plays are classified as being either tragedies or comedies that has a different type of ending. Comedies end happily, while the tragedies end on an unhappy note. Tragedy is a genre of drama that narrates the tragic events caused by a heroic individual. Often, involving literary works like novels, it is a serious and dignified approach to drama. And the term Catracius, coined by Aristotle, refers to the emotional release experienced by spectators during dramatic tragedies. This process, which can be seen in theater or literature, involves the same emotion experienced by the characters on stage or on the page, allowing the audience to fully experience the emotional tension and cleansing brought about by the work of art. In classical tragedy, the protagonist is often a significant figure who leads to a bad end due to a tragic flow, a moral weakness or weakness that caused their downfall. This flow is often seen as an alternative to hamartia, where the tragic hero's catastrophe is caused by an error in judgment. Domestic tragedy is a literary genre that explores the relationship and conflicts within families, often focusing on ordinary people in the middle and lower class. It delves into the private lives of characters, exploring their innermost thoughts and emotions. The themes often revolve around tension and power struggles arising from living in close proximity. Romantic comedy, also known as rom-com, is a subgenre of comedy and slice-of-life fiction, focusing on light-hearted thought lines and romantic themes. 
It often features young, likable lovers who face obstacles like class differences, parental interference, and a previous relationship. But despite these challenges, they ultimately unite, often with a fairy tale style happy ending. Farce is a comedy that is absurd, often involving deception and miscommunication. It is characterized by slapstick humor and physical comedy. A tragic farce is a bleak but still present form of farce with bleak humor. Farce aims to entertain audience through exaggerated, extravagant, ridiculous, absurd, and improbable situations. They are characterized by heavy use of physical humor, deliberate absurdity, satire, parody, mockery of real-life situation, unlikely miscommunication, ridiculous characters, and broadly stylized performance. Comedy of manners is a witty form of dramatic comedy that saturates contemporary society's manners and affectations. It is concerned with social usage and the question of whether characters meet certain social standards. The comedy often features stereotypical stock characters, such as Miles Gloriousus in ancient times, the Fof and Freak during the Restoration, or an old person pretending to be young. The flat of comedy is often less important than its witty dialogue, making it a cerebral form of entertainment. And sentimental comedy, a 18th century dramatic genre, featured middle class protagonists triumphantly overcoming moral trials to produce tears rather than laughter. It reflected contemporary philosophical conceptions of humans as inherently good but capable of being led astray through bad example. The plays, despite their overly virtuous natures and easily resolved trials, were accepted by audience as truthful representation of human predicament. Their roots can be traced back to the early 18th century tragedy, which had a moral vein similar to sentimental comedy but with luxury characters and subject matter. And lastly, melodrama. It is a dramatic work that sensationalizes events, plots, and characters to elicit strong emotional responses from the audience. It focuses on exciting over the top situations, often with stereotypical or simple roles like good versus evil situations. Melodrama is often referred to as melodramatic, referring to something overly dramatic or emotional. A strong characterization is not a feature of this genre. So, good day everyone. I am Joan May Molano, and today I am going to tackle about the elements of drama. So, first, let's define the elements of drama. The elements of drama refer to the fundamental components that make up a dramatic work. The elements of drama are essential components that bring a theatrical production to life. These elements include plot, characters, theme, dialogue, set design, lighting design, costume design, mask, makeup, technical production, sound and sound effects. That later will be discussed by the other members of this group. These elements collectively contribute to the structure, impact, and storytelling of a dramatic piece, whether it's a play, film, or any for any other form of theatrical expression. Yung elements of drama, ito yung pangunahing bahagi na bumubuo sa isang dula or isang kwento. Kung wala ang elements of drama, walang kwento or dula na mangyayari. On the other hand, yung elements of drama is yun yung bumubuhay sa isang kwento. So let's start with the first type of elements of drama, which is the plot. Plot indicates that it refers to the ordered sequence of events or incidents that form the narrative of a story. In essence, the plot is the structured arrangement of key events that unfold in a particular order to create a cohesive and meaningful storyline. It encompasses the various twists, turns, and developments that characters undergo contributing to the overall progression and resolution of the narrative. So, itong plot is yung pagkakasunod-sunod ng mga mahalagang pangyayari na naglalarawan ng buong kwento. So, there are structures that makes up the plot. 
First is conflict. Conflict is a collision of actions, ideas, desires, or wills. It can manifest in three main forms. First is person against person. This type of conflict involves a struggle or confrontation between individuals. It could be a dispute, disagreement, or ongoing clash between characters with opposing goals or interests. Ito yung uri ng tunggalian sa kwento kung saan may laban o alitan yung isang tao laban sa isa pang tao from the word itself, person against person. For example, yung storya ng kadenang ginto, kung natatandaan nyo, yung laging magkaaway doon is si Narumina laban kay Daniela, tas si Kasi laban kay Marga. Ganon. Second is person against environment. In this form of conflict, an individual contends with external forces such as nature, society, or fate. It includes battles against physical elements, societal expectations, or predetermined circumstances that act as obstacles to the person's objectives or aspirations. For example, yung story ng movie ng Jumanji, kung napanood nyo yun, yung kwento dun is yung mga karakter na ipit sa isang misteryosong at mapanganib na kagubatan dahil sa paglalaro nila ng Jumanji board game. Yung mga pagsubok na kailangan nilang harapin dun is nagbula sa mga hayop hanggang sa mga likas na yaman sa mga natural disaster or um, environment nila na nagpapahayag sa mga hadlang na pangkalikasan or person against environment na kailangan nilang lagpasan para mabuhay sila matapos yung laro at makalabas sila ng buhay sa board game na yon. Yun yung example ng person against environment. The last one is person against herself or himself. It typically means internal conflict or self-struggle. This can encompass inner battles, self-doubt, or engaging in behaviors that are detrimental to one's own well-being. It reflects a personal challenge within herself or himself. Okay, pag sinabi natin person against her herself or himself, ito ay laban sa sariling isipan o damdamin. For example, yung movie ng Black Swan, Yung main character doon is isang ballet dancer na nagsa-struggle with her own perfectionism, insecurities, and the psychological challenges she faces as she strives for excellence in her performance. Yan yung example ng person against herself or himself. Protagonist and antagonist. Sa madaling salita, yung protagonist is main character or central figure in a story. They are typically the one whose journey, actions, and experiences drive the narrative forward. The protagonist is often faced with challenges or conflicts that they must overcome, and the audience usually empathizes with or follows their perspective throughout the story. While an antagonist is a character or force in a story that opposes or goes against the protagonist, the antagonist creates conflict and serves as an obstacle for the main character, contributing to the overall tension and development of the narrative. Sa madaling salita, yung antagonist is kontrabida sa kwento. For example, yung protagonist and antagonist character is yung sa film ng Harry Potter, which is yung protagonist or main character dun is si Harry Potter and yung main antagonist dun is si Lord Voldemort. Next is artistic unity. Artistic unity is the condition of a literary piece whereby all its elements, characters, setting, plot, conflict, and theme successfully work together to achieve its central purpose of idea, theme, meaningful, or value of the story. An example of artistic unity is the movie of Alice in Wonderland. Particularly in its various adaptations, including the 1951 Disney animated film and the 2010 live-action film directed by Tim Burton. These ad adaptations often showcase a consistent visual style, imaginative 
world building, and thematic coherence. In both versions, the whimsical and fantastical nature of Wonderland is visually striking and creatively unified. The unique characters, vibrant colors, and surreal landscapes contribute to a cohesive artistic experience. The narrative, while inherently whimsical and nonsensical, maintains a thematic unity centered around Ali's journey of self-discovery and exploration. The last one is plot manipulation. It is the ability to control the plot itself. It is the ability to create, destroy, or control the plot that governs reality. One example is Avengers Endgame. The film utilizes time travel and intricate planning to, manip to manipulate the plot, creating surprising and unforeseen developments. The narrative twists in Avengers Endgame play a crucial role in the resolution of the overarching storyline of the MCU or the Marvel Cinematic Universe, showcasing elements of plot manipulation for dramatic effect. The next topic that we are going to talk about is character. It is a person or animal who appears in a movie, play, or in a story. It is a representation of an individual personality in a fictional or dramatic work. A character can play in a role as antagonist, protagonist, supporting character, or side character. We have two types of presentation. First is direct presentation. It is all about telling. Author describes the character di directly to the reader through narration. It tells about what the character looks like, what they do, and hints at their character personality. For example, Natalie is a flight attendant. She is tall and beautiful with a bright smile on her face. And the second one is indirect presentation. It is all about showing. Readers infers the character personality. It reveals personality through dialogue, character actions, and interaction. For example, Natalie was the kind of girl who would love to help to anyone at any time. So now we are going to talk about the different types of a character. The first one is flat character. They are known as a simple character that has one or two personality traits. A flat character does not have flaws for the story to address and resolve. In short, they serve a singular purpose or they are side character only. The second one is round character. Most main characters in the story are round characters. They are multidimensional and these characters surprises the audiences or readers. They reveal themselves over the course of the story and they feel like a real person. And the third one is the stock character. It is a special kind of a flat character who is instantly recognizable to most readers because they are known for a stereotypical character, for example, the cruel mother-in-law. And the fourth one is dynamic character. They change by the end of the story and change comes from when a character learns a lesson or overcomes their flaws. Protagonists are usually dynamic, but not always. And lastly, the static character. These are the characters who do not change during a story. Static characters can be either round or flat, but almost all flat characters are also static characters. And the next topic is all about theme. Theme is a universal idea lesson or message explored throughout a work of literature, such as in the stories, movies, play, and many more. One important feature of literary themes is their universality. 
which means that they represent greater truths about human experience that readers can apply to their own lives. These are the things that we must remember. Number one, a theme must be expressive in the form of a statement. Number two, assume must be stated as a generalization about life, name of characters, or a specific situation in the plot are not to be used when stating a theme. Number three, a theme must not be generalization larger than is justified by terms of the story. And number four, a theme is the central and unifying concept of the story. And number five, there is no one way of stating the theme of a story. Lastly, any statement that reduces a theme to some familiar saying, operism, or cliche should be avoided. Hi everyone, I'm Cherise, I'm Eamon Hakan, and I'm going to discuss the dialogue and set besides dialogue. It is the conversation between two or more people as a feature of a book, play, or movie. Ito yung pag-uusap ng dalawa o higit pang tauhan sa isang libro, play, or pelikula. It provides substance of a play, exposition of the play often falls on the dialogue of the characters. The explanation or description ay madalas nakikita o naririnig sa dialogue ng mga karakter. Should be read and heard as a dramatic score. Hindi lang dapat nababasa or naririnig ang dialogue kundi dapat may impact din. Works and shows out a subtextual stream of image even if the effect lies in the barest or simplest of speeches. We may expect to hear the text human the tone as it cannot in real life. Ang dialogue ay dapat maintindihan ng mga manonood kahit hindi direktang ipinapakita ng kilos o salita ang galaw. The sense of decorum must be established by the characters that is appropriate to the role and situation of a character. Dapat maayos na magampanan ng mga karakter ang kanilang role. And lastly, we should remember that exposition established the relationship, tension, or conflicts from which later plot develops or derived. And now, let's talk about the set design. Set design is the arrangement of theatrical space. The set or settings is the visual environment in which a play is performed. Dito ginaganap yung mga teatro. Settings can be generally be classified as realistic, abstract, suggestive, or functional. Realistic is it tries to create a specific location. Abstract is um, it does not imitate or even try to imitate reality. Uh, gumagamit to ng panels, drape, props, platforms, and steps. Uh, habang ang suggestive or functional is it will provide ito ng pro, uh, fragments para maging realistic yung settings by um, eliminating the non-essential. In Europe, one person frequently called a scenographer, design set, costume, and lights. In the U.S., this function are usually handed, handled by three separate profession, professionals. Um, sa Europe, may scenographer or uh, production designer na nagde-develop ng appearance of a stage design or TV or movie set. Um, habang sa U.S. naman, uh, yung tatlong yon, which are the, the set design, design set, costume, at life, ay iba-ibang nag-aayos. Hindi tulang sa Europe, may isang tao lang. Uh, the purpose of it is to suggest time and place and to suggest time and place um, to be able to create a proper mood atmosphere. Uh, they need to create a proper mood atmosphere para magampan nila ang role and needed situation para sa pag -actor. And that's all. Thank you for listening and I hope you learned something. Hi, good day. My name is Jaden Pukaan, and now I will discuss about lighting design. So what is lighting design? It's a primary art and it has a two function. The first one is to illuminate the stage and the performers and create a mood. The next one is to control the focus of the spectators. 
Lighting design aids involves the deliberate and strategic use of light to enhance the visual aspect of a theatrical performance. This includes the placement, intensity, color, and movement of lights to um, achieve specific effects, set the mood, emphasize characters or scenes, and contribute to the overall atmosphere of the production. Stage lightning may be from a directed source, such as sun and the lamp, or sometimes it may be indirect by employing a reflected light or illumination. Lighting design has a four controllable properties. The first one is the intensity, the color placement on stage, and the movement, and lastly is the visible changing of the first three properties. These properties are used to achieve visibility, mood, composition, and the overall arrangement of light, shadow, and color. And the revelation of form, the appearance of a shape is a um, dimensionality of a former or object, as determined by the light. The lighting designer is often responsible for projections. This includes still or moving images that substitute for or enhance painted scenery and create special effects such as stars or moonlight or provide written legends for the identification of scenes. The lights are, um, are controlled by skilled technician and it's called electrician. The most recent development in lighting technology is the memory board. It is a computerized control system that stores the information of each light cue or change of lights. So let's move on to the next topic, which is costume design. So what is the costume? Costume is whatever is worn on the performer's body. Costume designers are concerned primarily with clothing and accessories, but they're also often responsible for wigs, masks, and makeup. Costumes convey information about the character and aid in the setting, the tone and mood of the production, because most of uh, acting involves impersonation. Most costuming is actual or recreated historical or contemporary dress as with the scenery. Costume involves the creation and selection of clothing and accessories worn by um, actors during a performance. The costume designers collaborate with the direct, um, directors, set designers, and other production members to ensure that the costume aligns with the overall vision of the play or production. Costume is not only serve practical purposes but also contribute to the um, characterization and visual aesthetic of the performance and helping bring the characters and the story to life on stage. As with the other forms of design, subtle effects can be achieved through um, choice of color, pro fabric, cut, texture, and weight or material because costume can indicate such as things as a um, social class and personality traits and can um, physical attributes as obesity or deformity. deformity. An actor's work can be significantly eased by its skillful design. Okay. And also, costume can also function as a character signature. My name is Mikaela A. Pameran from BSN1 YA48. Makeup may also function as a mask, especially in Oriental theater. In Western theater, makeup is used for two purposes to emphasize and reinforce facial features that might otherwise be loose under breath or at a distance, and to alter signs of age, skin tone, or no shape. So in Oriental theater, makeup serves as a symbolic and transformative role, functioning as a mask by painting faces with elaborate colors and images. This practice often seen in traditional forms like Chinese opera or Japanese kabuki, exaggerates and disturbs facial features to represent specific character traits, emotion, or archetypal roles. The in-create design and vibrant color contribute to a styled and visually striking presentation enhancing the performance, performer's ability to convey complex characters in a symbolic manner. In Western theater, makeup serves as a dual purpose. Previously, it is 
is used to emphasize and reinforce spatial features that might be diminished under the bright stage lights or when viewed from a distance by the audience. This is the particularly crucial for ensuring that actors' expression are clearly visible and can effectively convey emotion to the spectators. Secondly, makeup is employed to alter signs of age, skin tone, or no shape, allowing actors to convincingly portray characters of varying backgrounds, time periods, or age groups. The transformative power of makeup in both Oriental and Western theater underscores its significance as a tool for storytelling, whether creating symbolic masks or subtle adjusting facial features. Makeup contributes to the overall theoretical experience by aiding in the character representation and ensuring that the visual aspect of a performance align with the narrative and emotional intent. So that's all. Thank you, Po. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jen Rachi Palpalatok of Group 2. Let's talk about technical aspect or technical production. Technical production may be divided into pre-production, which is before the production phase, and run of production, which is during the production phase. Pre-production naman is supervised by technical director. Yan daw. Technical director daw ang nangunguna sa pre-production. During this phase sa technical production, set, props, and costume are made. Yan. Now, let's talk about props. What is props muna? Props is the object handled by actors or used in dressing the stage or object. Plays are carried on the set that are not costume or scenery. Now, example of props is like the, the Tower of, of Rapunzel or yung, yung Lampara kapag madilim. Yun. Or yung wall. Example na rin nun is parang wall na rin siya, brick wall. Yun. Like acts, props can be illusionistic. They may be created by paper mache or plastic for lightness. Exa they can be exaggerated in size, irregularly shaped, or designed to appear level on a, re on a right stage. Right stage. They may also be capable of being rolled, collapsed, or folded. Kaya yun nga sinasabi ko, diba? Example na nun is yung wall. Parang yung sa, sh parang yung sa showtime. May makikita kayo minsan sa showtime. Kapag nagbabardagulan sila, Vice Ganda, and sila, Vong Navarro, tapos sinampas ni Vice Ganda si Vong Navarro, tumalasik dun sa parang ak akalain yung wall. Yung pala, magkocollapse pala siya. Parang matutumba, kas pa matutumba si Vong Navarro kasama yung wall na yun. Parang siyang ganun. Yun na yun, example na yun ng prop. Now, the person, is in, the person in charge in props is the prop master or mistress. Yun. Master is for a guy and mistress is for a lady or a girl. Sound, if required, is now generally recorded during reproduction period. From earliest time, most the theatrical performance were accompanied by music that, until recently, were produced by live musician. Since the 1930s, however, use of recorded sound has been a possibility in the theater. Although, music is still the most common sound effect, wind, rain, thunder, and animal noises has been essential, essential since the earliest Greek tragedies. Any sound that cannot be created by a performer may be considered a sound effect. Such sounds are most often used by realistic effect. For example, a train rushing by or a, or a city sound outside a window. But they can also assist in the, in the creation of mood or rhythm. Bagamat, many sounds can be recorded from actual sources. Certain sounds do not record well and seem false when played through electronic equipment on a stage. Elaborate mechanical devices are therefore constructed to simulate these sounds such as rain or thunder. 
technicians who is also responsible for the making of sound or sound effect also create special oral and visual effects simulating explosions, fire, lightning, or apparition, or giving the illusion of moving object or of flying. Now, thank you everyone for listening my part, and that's all. History of Drama The history of drama is a captivating journey throughout the evolution of human expression, showcasing the rich tapestry of narratives that have unfolded on the stage throughout centuries. This introduction aims to provide a glimpse into the origin and milestone of dramatic arts, exploring how this form of storytelling has endured and transformed across diverse civilization and eras. The history of drama starts from ancient drama to modern drama. First is the ancient drama or ancient Greek drama. It's a theatrical culture that flourished in ancient Greece from 700 BC. The city-state of Athens, which became a significant cultural, political, and military power during this period, was its center where it was instituted institutionalized as part of a festival called the Dionysia, which honored the god Dionysus. Although the accounts of this period are inadequate, it appears that the poet Thespis developed a new musical form in which he impersonated a single character and engaged a chorus of singer-dancer in dialogue. Ancient drama are the place where integral religious festival and civic events serving both entertainment and cultural purposes. Ancient drama such as Greek or Roman theater was typically performed in outer amphitheaters and the actors were masked to portray various characters and the performances often involved a chorus that commented on the events. The actors uses exaggerated gesture and vocal techniques which help them convey emotion to large audience. So the next type of drama that we have is medieval drama. So what is medieval drama? When medieval drama emerged hundreds of years later, it was a new creation rather than a rebirth. The reason for this creation came from a quarter that had traditionally opposed any form of theater, which is the Christian church. In the Easter service and later in the Christmas service, bits of chanted dialogue called tropes were interpolated into the liturgy. Priests impersonating biblical figures acted out minuscule scenes from the holiday stories. Eventually, these playlets grew more elaborate and abandoned the inside of the church for the church steps and the adjacent marketplace. Secular elements crept in as the, as the artisan guide took responsibility for these performances. Although the glorification of God and the redemption of humanity remained prime concerns, the celebration of local industry was not neglected. After music was introduced into, into the churches in the 6th century, and words were later fitted into the melodies, a dramatic dialogue began to take place in the form of an alternation of chants in between the priest and the choir. And later on, processional and scenic effects were added, which increased the dramatic action. Liturgical drama evolved into miracle and mystery plays, and this once into morality plays. Restoration and 18th century drama refers to the theatrical works that were produced in England after the restoration of the monarchy in 1660 and until the late 1700s. This period saw the emergence of new genres such as comedy of manners, heroic tragedy, and sentimental comedy, as well as the adaptation of older plays such as those by Shakespeare's into semi-operas, Restoration and 18th century drama also witnessed the rise of the first professional female actors and the popularity of the novel as a new form of literature. Some of the main features of this period are the use of realism and bawdiness, wit and satire, 
to portray the manners and morals of upper-class society, the development of the comedy of manners, a genre that focuses on the intrigues and scandals of the fashionable elite, the emergence of female playwrights, who wrote the challenge of patriarchal norms and stereotypes of their time, the appearance of the first professional female actors who played both male and female roles and gained fame and fortune on the stage, and the adaptation of older plays such as those by Shakespeare into semi-operas which added music, dance, and spectacle to the drama, some of the most famous and influential playwrights of this period include John Dryden, William Congreve, Richard Brinsland Sheridan, and Oliver Goldsmith. Some of the most influential theaters of this period were the Jury Lane Theater, which was founded by Thomas Killigrew in 1663 and rebuilt several times after fires and riots and the novel emerged as a new form of literature in the 18th century. Partly influenced by the popularity of French romances and partly by the rise of literacy and print culture. Some of the earliest and most influential novelists in, of this period were Daniel Defoe, Samuel Richardson, Henry Fieldling, Lawrence Turney, and Jane Austen. Journals and periodicals were another important source of information and entertainment in the 18th century. They provided news, opinions, essays, reviews, poems, stories, and other forms of writing on various topics and issues. Some of the most famous and influential journals of this period were The Spectator, The Tatler, The Gentleman's Magazine, The Rambler, and The Edinburgh Review. They helped shape the public opinion and taste of the readers and also contributed to the development of literary criticism and journalism. Hello everyone, I am Aliana Din Miranda and I'm here to discuss the 19th century drama and the Romantic Rebellion. In the early 19th century, Romanticism emerged as a response to the rationalism of the Enlightenment. The Romantics, including the famous playwright Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, focused on the spiritual realm as a means for humankind to transcend the limitations of the physical world. Goethe's epic drama, Faust, serves as a prime example. It delves into the timeless theme of a man selling his soul to the devil, portraying the relentless human pursuit of mastering all knowledge and power in its constant struggle with the universe. The Romantics drew inspiration from nature and the natural man, believing that studying the real world, rather than the ideal, could unlock profound truths. This perspective manifested in the portrayal of supposedly untouched figures like Native Americans. This shift marked a departure from the structure norms of neoclassicism paving the way for a more emotionally charged and experimental approach to dramatic expression. While Romanticism initially took root in Germany, it swiftly dominated the theaters of Europe. In France, playwrights like René Charles Gulbert de Pixier Court set the stage for the French Romantic movement. However, it was Victor Hugo's Hernani in 1830 that is often hailed as the first French Romantic drama. Hernani marked a departure from convention, with Hugo challenging the norms of the time and ushering in a new era of theatrical expression characterized by emotion and individualism. Romanticism glorified the idea of the artist as a mad genius, unrestricted by rules. This celebration of individual creativity led to a vast array of undisciplined yet emotionally charged dramatic literature and production. Then let's proceed to the modern drama. Modern drama from the time of the Renaissance on, theater seemed to be striving for total realism or at least for the illusion of reality. It refers to a broad category of theatrical works produced in the late 19th and 20th century. Encompassing diverse style, 
theme and movements, it reflects the cultural, social, and political shape of its time. Exploring new forms of expression and challenging traditional theatrical convention. The originator of many anti-realist ideas was the German opera composer Richard Wagner. He believed that the job of the playwright and composer was to create myths. He sought to depict the soul state or inner being of characters rather than their superficial realistic aspects. Wagner was unhappy with the lack of unity among the individual arts that constituted the drama. He proposed the Gesamtkunstwerk, the total artwork, in which all dramatic elements are unified, preferably under the control of the single artistic creator. And Wagner was also responsible for reforming theater, architecture, and dramatic presentation with his festival theater at Bayreuth, Germany, completed in the year 1876. The Philippine drama is rich and diverse and compassive with various forms of theater and television productions. Let's talk about how or when did the drama start in the Philippines. During the pre-colonial period, indigenous drama were performed as religious social rituals, verbal jokes, games, songs, and dances dedicated to their gods. An example of the indigenous drama in the pre-Hispanic times is the Pagdewata, a ritual that is held by the Tagbanwas to thank the spirits for a good harvest or plan for a cure for the sick. The ritual is still practiced up to this day. Another example is Karagatan and Duplo, a poetical debate about a ring that fell into the sea. New theatrical genres inspired by Spanish customs arose with the entrance of the Spanish colonists. Drama in the Philippines during the Spanish colonial era denoted prose plays with little to no music accompaniment. Although they followed the morality and ideals that the Spaniards approved of, these plays frequently address current situations. The drama during the Spanish colonial period in the Philippines often revolved around religious themes due to the Catholic Church and the Spanish authorities. Examples of Spanish-influenced plays are Senaculo, Moro Moro, Zarzuela, Mariones, and Ati Atihan. Senaculo Senaculo is a dramatic reenactment of the Passion of Christ, depicting the events leading up to the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is typically performed during Holy Week. The actors, known as Senaculistas, portray various biblical characters including Jesus, Mary, the apostles, Roman soldiers, and other figures from the Passion narrative. The Senaculistas either present their performance in Hablada or Cantada style. But what is Hablada and Cantada? Cantada is a performance style in which the discussion or text is sung. Meanwhile, Hablada is a style in which the narration or text is spoken or recited. A deadline in Senacula performance in the provinces and cities has occurred in recent years, but over time, this sacred drama made its way onto professional stages where innovative special effects, lighting, and sound equipment enhanced the staging spectacle. Moro Moro The Moro Moro is a traditional form of Filipino theater that emerged during the Spanish colonial period in the Philippines. During the Spanish colonial era, which lasted for more than three centuries, 1565 to 1898, the Spanish authorities sought to assert control over the indigenous cultures of the Philippines. One way they attempted to do this was by suppressing native traditions and promoting Christianity as means of cultural assimilation. The Spanish friars and authorities discouraged and often suppressed indigenous forms of entertainment, including traditional Filipino theatrical performances. More and more is a dramatic performance that revolves around stage battles between Christians and Moros, referring to the Muslims. Particularly, the Muslim inhabitants in the southern parts of the Philippines known as the Moro region. The Moro Moro play is common lalo na if during fiestas and other celebrations. In these Moro Moro plays, the Moros 
were consistently depicted as the antagonist, symbolizing the perceived threat of Islam and the resistance of Spanish Christianization. The narratives often portrayed the Christians as victorious over the Moros, reinforcing the idea of the triumph of Christianity over Islam. This portrayal served the dual purpose of entertaining the local population while also promoting the dominance of the Spanish colonial power and the spread of Christianity. Zazuela is a melodrama, a three-act play featuring songs and dances, aims to evoke sublime emotions and depict political and social conditions in the audience. The Zazuela is a musical comedy. Rizal wrote the Zazuela entitled Junto al Pasig, or Beside the Pasig. It was staged at the Ateneo de Manila on December 8, 1880 on the occasion of the celebration of the feast day of the Immaculate Conception, the patron saint of the college. During American rule, Moro Moro was replaced by Zazuela, reflecting the Philippine Revolution. Early Zazuela, such as Love for the Native Land by Pascual Poblete, Gold Chain by Juan Abad, Free by Remigio, Yesterday, Today and Tomorrow by Tolentino, and Not Wounded by Reyes were banned. The Filipino theater's popularity declined due to the introduction of Hollywood talkies in the 1930s, resulting in the decline of popular theater art like Zazuela, which remained popular until today. The Zazuela Foundation of the Philippines, organized by Imelda R. Marcos and Theodore F. Valencia, or Valencia rather, aims to revive and develop the Philippine theater form, fostering nationwide support. The foundation revived Severino Reyes 1902 Zazuela Ogat in 1977 as part of a cultural past-focused approach to produce contemporary works. Good morning everyone. Today, I'm here to present a report on the Marianas Festival, a unique and captivating celebration that takes place annually during Holy Week in Marinduque, Philippines. This festival is steeped in rich traditions and folklore, creating a vibrant tapestry of culture and faith. So, let's dive into the key details of this fascinating event. The Marianas Festival is an annual event held during Holy Week in Marinduque, Philippines. It is a significant celebration that combines religious devotion, cultural traditions, and captivating legends. During the festival, locals and visitors dress up as Roman soldiers, donning elaborate and vibrant costumes. The term Marianas refers to the participants who dressed up as Roman soldiers during the festival. Colorful and sometimes grotesque. When we say grotesque, it is odd or unnatural in shape, fantastically ugly or absurd. Wooden masks are worn to conceal their identities. The most distinctive feature of the Marianas Festival is the use of colorful, intricately crafted wooden masks. These masks are often designed to appear both striking and fearsome, adding an element of mystery and intrigue to the festival. The festival is based on the legend Langinus of based on Langinus, a one-eyed Roman soldier. Longinus is a central figure in the Marianas Festival's narrative, drawing inspiration from historical and biblical references. According to the legend, Longinus was the centurion responsible for 
piercing just aside with a spear during the crucifixion. The legend states that when launching his blind eye came into contact with the drop of Christ's blood, his sight was miraculously restored. Launching his newfound faith and the restoration of his eyesight became a pivotal moment in his life, leading him to convert to Christianity and openly declare his beliefs. The festival includes various rituals that depict the story of Longinus. The Brianna's festival reenacts key moments from Longinus' story, immersing participants and spectators in the legend's narrative. Longinus is appointed as the head of the guards watching over Christ's tomb. The reenactment involves Longinus being assigned as the leader of the guards who are tasked with protecting Christ's tomb. He witnessed the miracle of he witnesses the miracle of the resurrection and spread the news despite despite attempts to suppress it. As part of the festival, Longinus witnesses the miracle of Christ Christ's resurrection and becomes an eyewitness to this profound event. Despite efforts to suppress the news, Longinus boldly shares the Longinus boldly shares the story, spreading the message of the Christ triumph over spreading the message of the Christ triumph over death. The reenactment includes a trial scene in the town plaza, where Longinus is brought before Pontius Pilate, who of who orders his execution by beheading. Before his execution, Longinus addresses the crowd in a poignant in a poignant moment, Longinus speaks to the gathered crowd, sharing his personal testimony and narrating the restoration of his eyesight through divine intervention. Longinus recounts the miraculous event of his sight being restored after coming into contact with a drop of Christ's blood, emphasizing his newfound faith and devotion. At noon, Longinus is beheaded as part of the reenactment. The reenactment reaches its climax as Longinus is executed by beheading, symbolizing his martyrdom and the sacrifice he made for his faith. Fellow Marianas participate in solemn procession carrying Longinus' headless body throughout the town, creating a somber and introspective atmosphere. The Marianas festival includes with the symbolic burial of Longinus. The festival's finale involves the symbolic burial of Longinus, representing the end of the reenactment and the culmination of the festival. This burial signifies the end of the reenactment and the culmination of the festival. The symbolic burial serves as a powerful reminder of the sacrifice and the faith that the Marianas festival represents the Marianas Faith that the Marianas festival represents, concluding the festivities on a reflective note. In conclusion, Marianas, with their striking mask and the dedication. In conclusion, the Marianas, with their striking masks and dedication to prevent. In conclusion, the Marianas, with their striking mask and dedication to preserving tradition, are integral part of the Marianas Festival in Marinduque. Their participation brings to life the legends and stories associated with the festival, captivating audiences and reinforcing the cultural significance of this annual celebration. The Marianas exemplify the spirit of devotion, artistry, and cultural pride that defines the festival and makes and makes it a cherished event in in the Philippines.
So now, we will be discussing the magnificent celebration of Ati Atiha. It is an annual ritual celebrated in Kalibu Aklan, Philippines. Ati Atiha is a highly recorded festival in the Philippines. It takes place annually on the third Sunday of January. This historical celebration is centered around dance, merriment, and a deep devotion of, to the infant Jesus. The origins of Ati Atihan can be traced back to ancient times, although the exact beginnings have been lost in antiquity. The name Ati Atihan is derived from the term Atis, which refers to the indigenous Nicritos residing in the Visayas region. Originally, Ati Atihan was a ritual conducted by the indigenous people as an expression of gratitude towards as an expression of gratitude towards their deities. During the period of Spanish colonization, the authorities sought to sought to suppress this indigenous ritual. However, instead of completely eradicating it, the Spanish incorporated Christian elements into the celebration. They dedicated a Atihan to the Santo Niño, the representation of the infant Jesus. The festival also acquired Christian and historical significance due to the victories achieved by the Spaniards in battles against Muslim attacks in Calibo. In one particular battle, the defenders of the Santo Niño's fortress disguised themselves as Atis by smearing soot on their faces and bodies. This successful defense led the people of Calibo to attribute their triumph to the Santo Niño and sub subsequently dedicated dedicate the Ati Atihan celebration to the infant Jesus. In the present day, in the present day, participants of Ati Atihan dressed in flamboyant costume that emulate the tribal attire of the Atis. These costumes often inter this costume often incorporate feathers palm rods, and improvised materials. The festival spans three consecutive nights and it's characterized by exuberant dancing, merrymaking, and lively celebrations. The, and lively celebrations. The streets of Kalibo came alive with joy, music. The streets of Kalibo come with the streets of Kalibo come alive with joy, music, and vibrant colors during the Atetihan season. Atetihan is not merely a celebration of joy and colors, but is also served as a testament to the people's de devotion to the infant Jesus and their profound appreciation of their culture and history. It is a special occasion that fosters unity and embodies the spirit of the Filipino people. Well, that wraps up our drama journey for today. I hope you had as much fun exploring the magic of drama as we did. We hope you understand well and enjoy this video lecture. Thank you!